Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it, and without further ado, let's go. As my husband and I returned from our trip to upstate New York, fatigue weighed heavily upon me. My lupus had been particularly unkind during the journey, and I was grateful when we finally arrived at Port Authority. The urgency to relieve my aching bladder led me to the nearest restroom, a necessity heightened by my short, chubby frame and the support of my trusty walker. The restroom was surprisingly crowded, with a cacophony of voices echoing off the tiled wall. I navigated through the stalls, finding them all occupied except for one, the disabled stall, a necessity for me due to my walker's bulk. I positioned myself outside the stall, waiting patiently for its occupant to finish. Minutes ticked by, each one stretching like an eternity, as discomfort gnawed at me. Ten minutes passed, and with a tentative knock, I inquired about the stall's availability. A sharp voice pierced through the door, suggesting I use another saw with an unkind epithet attached. I explained my situation, my disability hoping for understanding. The woman inside the stall grumbled, and I heard the flush of the toilet twice, an odd occurrence given the automatic nature of the facilities. As she emerged, her demeanor matched her initial words, hostile and disdainful. She was larger than me, both in height and weight, sporting an array of expensive clothing and long green cornrows. I hurried past her into the stall, eager to finally relieve myself. Inside the stall, I hurried through my business, unaware of the storm brewing outside. The banging on the door startled me, demanding I vacate the stall immediately. Her threats grew louder, accusing me of stepping on her precious shoe and promising dire consequences. Fear gripped me as I imagined the worst from this irate stranger over a trivial mishap. Just when panic threatened to overwhelm me, a new voice cut through the chaos, a tiny yet commanding voice that called out the aggressor. Which, shut your fat butt up, you ain't no thug. The unexpected defender turned out to be a diminutive granny, standing at a mere 4'11", but exuding an aura of strength and resolve that belied her age. The granny's gaze softened as she turned to me, concern etched on her weathered face. Baby, are you okay? Her simple question held more warmth and empathy than I had encountered in that entire restroom ordeal. I nod gratefully, finding solace in her reassuring smile. With a stern look at her unruly companion, the granny ushered her away, diffusing the tension with her mere presence. As they exited... The resemblance between the two became apparent. The granny and the aggressor shared a familial bond, and it dawned on me that this was likely a grandmother-granddaughter-granddaughter duo. The granddaughter's bravado melted away in the face of her grandmother's authority, leaving behind a mix of embarrassment and contrition. The bathroom encounter, bizarre as it was, left a lasting impression on me. It was a reminder of the unexpected kindness that can emerge even in the most unlikely of places and the strength that comes from standing up for oneself and others. And as I left the restroom, my bladder finally at ease, I carried with me not just relief but also a newfound appreciation for the compassion of strangers, especially those like the fierce granny who stood up against injustice in her own unique way. For years, I am early 30s at the time, was close friends with Brittany, F, same age as me. Brittany and I had gone to college together gone on trips together, and were pretty much inseparable. She had always had a bit of an entitled streak to her, but it was never anything drastic. She usually kept it restrained to things like being the only one to pick which restaurant our group of friends went to or having her seat in each friend's home. Annoying, yes, but pretty mild overall. Then, Christmas hit. A mutual friend of ours decided to hold a Christmas get together for our large extended friend group, which included both me and Brittany. This friend, Mary, had recently gotten married and bought a new house with her new husband. Mar Mary's wedding had been a small, private family, only affair. To celebrate with friends, as well as celebrate their new house on the holiday, Mary invited about 30 people from our extended friend group to a big Christmas party. It was wonderful. Mary has always been one hell of a cook, and she insisted on providing everything for the guests. She did all of the cooking, bought tons of drinks, alcoholic and non-alcoholic, and made sure none of her guests were without a drink or plate of amazing food all night. Mary had only one request for her guest. Each person bring a gift to contribute to a white elephant gift exchange. Happily, especially given how much Mary and Matt shelled out to feed us all, 
we all brought a gift. For those not familiar white elephant exchanges, called Yankee Swap or Dirty Santa in some places, involve everyone bringing a wrapped gift. Then, one by one, each person chooses a gift from the pile. The first person opens his, her chosen gift. Then the second person can either open a new gift or steal the first person's gift. Third can steal second's or first's gift or pick a new one. On and on until everyone has had a chance. Then the first person gets the last chance to steal. One rule put in place in a lot of these exchanges is that a gift can only be stolen twice. So if you are the third person to get your hands on a gift, it is yours for good and no one can take it from you. This was the downfall of Mary's gift exchange, at least when it came to Brittany. The gift exchange started and people were having fun, stealing blankets, candles, gift cards, and the like from other friends. No one was upset if their gift was stolen. Hell, it's all for fun and we are all friends, right? Well, Matt, Mary's new husband and party co-host was really good at making his own beer. As his gift in the exchange, he wrapped up a full case of this amazing dark stout that he made. Bob opened that and was excited. We all knew how amazing the beer was as we had been drinking it all night at the party. Then Tim stole the beer from Bob. We laughed. Bob was disappointed, but he gave it over to Tim in spirit of the game. Then it was my turn. I stole the beer from Tim. Like Bob, Tim was disappointed, but willingly gave me the beer and laughed along with his disappointment. Notice that I was the third owner of the case of beer. That means that, per the rules of Mary's game, I was safe from having the beer stolen from me. Brittany was the next to go. She tried to steal the beer, but was reminded by several people that the beer had been stolen twice, so was now, officially, mine. Instead of just picking a new gift or stealing someone else's Brittany threw a fit. All the other gifts suck. That's not fair. The beer's the only thing I want. I wouldn't have played if I knew this stupid rule. On and on and on she went. She was making everyone uncomfortable, especially Mary. Matt intervened and politely asked Brittany to just play along. He reminded her there were still a few bottles of the stout in the kitchen if she wanted one. But no, Brittany couldn't handle not having the full case to take home with her. She pouted and refused to pick another gift or play the game. So we skipped her. The game continued on, and everyone other than Brittany had a gift. With only one gift left, Brittany was forced to take that or nothing. She chose nothing, and on top, continued to witch and moan about how unfair the rules were. The person who brought the unclaimed gift took it back and gave it to Mary and Matt as a housewarming gift. Seeing that, Brittany stormed out and left. I thought that would be the end of it, but I was wrong. Over the next few days, I was barraged with text messages from Brittany demanding that I give her the case of Matt's beer. She didn't ask if I would share it, which I probably would have done. She demanded that I give it to her outright, saying, you know, the rules were bullcrap and it should have been mine anyway. When I told her no, she started with guilt trips. You make more money than me, so you can buy expensive beer and I can't. We've been friends for so long, it's only right. You're just being selfish. The final message from her was, I hope you choke on it, asshole. I blocked her number, removed her from my Facebook friends list, and haven't spoken to her since. Nor, for that matter, have Mary and Matt nor about a third of the party guests. She lost a lot of friends all over a case of beer. It was damn good beer, though. I thought of Brittany every time I drank a bottle. This happened a few years back when I worked at a hotel. I myself was initially employed as a maintenance engineer with simple responsibilities, test pool chems, replace filters, room maintenance, etc. However, during the spring, I was changed to overnight pulling security while one of the night guards was heading to do his two weeks of army training. Luckily for me, I was also getting paid slightly more for the overnight shift, so I didn't complain much. As a night guard, you had to be keeping the peace around the hotel, all six floors. This wasn't a hassle because I had a backup guy with me most nights, so I wasn't alone handling some ruffians whenever they caused a stir. One night, I believe it was a Friday, and my partner called in. We had a group of adults hanging by the pool around 11 p.m. after the pool was closed half an hour earlier. It was something I was used to, so I entered the pool area and told them, party of six, that the pool was officially closed at 10.30. I got a couple scoffs and some complaints after, but they weren't too in a hurry to get out. 
taking their sweet time to get out, dried off, and went to the elevator. I noticed they left around nine bottles of alcohol near the pool and had to clean up after them. No big deal. Around 30 minutes later, we got a noise complaint from the fifth floor where some people were playing some loud music next door. I told the front desk lady that I'd check it out. Sure enough, I got up to the room that was complained about and knocked on the door, getting to see one of the patrons from the pool area answer the door. He looked like he would fall over out of exhaustion if you gave him a breathalyzer. Yo, sub security dude. Evening. I'm here to remind you to keep it down. I could hear you from across the building. People are trying to sleep. So what? Not my fault if they can't sleep through it. It will be your problem if we need to come back. We have plenty of pilots and businessmen that are staying the night and need to sleep. Get lost, kid. He slammed the door in my face and turned the music down to an acceptable level. I shrugged it off and headed back down to my post to check in with the front desk lady. I gave her the lowdown and went back to waiting for another call. Not even 30 minutes later, we get a call from a different room complaining of a smoking scent coming from the room next to theirs and loud music being played. I checked the fire panel and sure enough, a smoke detector was disconnected from the room I just visited. At this point, I was unnerved at their audacity to keep disturbing the peace, but then again, they seemed to be so drunk. I head back up there again and knock on the door. Sure enough, the music quiets and someone creeps up to the door. Someone had stuffed a towel under the door so no smoke could escape. Fun fact, that doesn't work, and they were trying to remove them without being noticed. I lick my lips out of irritation and wait for them to open the door again. Slowly, a guy opens the door. The light is off, and heck is there a whiff of weed in the room. Can I help you? He asks. Yeah, we got a complaint that your music was loud, and we got an alert saying your smoke alarm was disconnected from your wall. Is everything all right? Get lost. We're fine. Why do people have to be so nosy? Well, for one, I'm here to keep the hotel from going to hell. And two... I'm one of the maintenance people here. If your smokehead is acting up, I need to ensure it's working properly. Well, you can't right now. It's too dark in here to see. I smirk at him and flip the light switch. Lo and behold, he and his party were getting lit like 4th of July. They had little baggies on the floor filled with green leaf of goodness, a couple Zippos, and broken liquor bottles all over. This is when crap started to hit the fan. What the heck, man? We're trying to sleep here. Looks like you're doing more than sleeping. What's in those baggies? None of your business. Now get the heck out. Absolutely, because I'm kicking you out and finding room for smoking. Chill out, dude. We're not even smoking cig. I'm pretty sure you don't have any cigarettes in here, especially from what I'm seeing and selling. I'm partial to getting the police involved here real quick, but I'll tell you what. You can get out, take the fine, and find another hotel, or I call the local police and have them arrest you for possession. Me and my partner were fairly lenient on drugs. As long as you took the fine and left, we didn't do much else. Oh, screw you. I've had it with you, Red. Uh, cops. You have 15 minutes to grab your stuff starting now. I shut the door and start walking towards the elevator, feeling a bit irritable, but shrugging it off as I walk. A couple seconds later, the door opened. I don't think much of it, but in an instant, I felt something slam into the back of my skull with a strong force. I lunge forward and turn around to see the same douchebag I'd just talked to grab an unopened bottle of ale and smack me in the back of the head with it. At this point, I'm livid. Bear in mind, I'm not the strongest guy, but I can take a hit, 5'8", and around 250 obes, so I'm a bit on the heavier side. I glare at him, straight in the eye. Out of his drunken vigor, he decided to take another swing at me. I blocked the bottle with my arm and pulled out my baton, knocking the inside of his knee in to get him to fall forward. As he did, he dropped his bottle and I quickly kneed his back so he fell onto the ground and I cuffed him. He squirmed and cursed me out, waking up most of the floor and having a couple people come out of their rooms to see the commotion. The other party people were shaking and scurrying towards the elevator with their belongings where I followed after them and headed down to the lobby. One girl asks, are you going to arrest him? Another one answers her and says, I want to get arrest us too? The guy cuffed in my hands tells them, no, he's a scardy cat. He won't arrest you. He just likes showing off. I say, no, I can't arrest you. I'll leave that to the police. Because you're too fat to be a cop, he spits out. 
but I just ignore him. We arrive at the lobby and the rest of the party bolts for the other elevators to the ground floor so they can get the heck out of the hotel. I bring the guy down and throw him into a chair and tell the front desk lady, who was panicking at the time because I'm pretty sure I was bleeding, adrenaline is a wonderful thing to have, to call the police. She gets off the phone with them and says it'll be 30 minutes. The guy is sitting in the chair spouting profanities till an officer comes about 35 minutes later. The officer walks up to the desk and turns to the guy. The officer shook his head slightly in disbelief because he recognized the guy. Turns out he had a warrant for his arrest in another city for possession, selling assault and attempted murder. The officer wasted no time calling up his buddy who must have been waiting downstairs in a squad car. The officer asked if he assaulted me and if I wanted to press charges. I declined but didn't mention that there was a stash of drugs and paraphernalia up in the room. His backup arrived and kept an eye on the suspect. We went back to the room, and sure enough, there were still some drugs hiding in cracks and crevices, the toilet bowl, the sink, even under the mattress. I guess there was about three or four pounds of just drugs, not entirely sure how I came to that conclusion. We went back to the guy who denied having possession of any drugs until the officer dangled a baggie in front of him. He got arrested, and they escorted him down to the squad car downstairs, and that was the last I heard of him. Funnily enough, a few days later, I found out that the room wasn't in his name, but one of the girl's name. Turns out she was also wanted, and her card had the billing address where she was actually living with the second girl. Overall, I had one of the worst nights of my life, but I digress. My head hurt for a week, no major bleeding, but there was a bump. Was it worth it? Probably. Okay, yeah, it was totally worth it. It was a quiet day in the neighborhood, and I decided to take a stroll around the block to clear my head. As I walked, I noticed a commotion a few houses down. As I got closer, I realized it was my neighbor, Karen, yelling at the mailman. Now, Karen is no ordinary neighbor. She's the epitome of entitled parents, and she always finds something to complain about. I tried to avoid her as much as possible, but this time, I couldn't help but get involved. Excuse me, Karen, what's going on here? I asked, trying to defuse the situation. This incompetent mailman can't seem to deliver my package on time, she said, her face turning red with anger. I ordered it two days ago, and it still hasn't arrived. Maybe there was a delay or something, I said, trying to reason with her. I don't care about your excuses, she snapped. I want my package, and I want it now. At this point, I knew there was no reasoning with her. Karen was always like this, demanding things and treating people like they were beneath her. I decided to step in and help the mailman, who looked visibly shaken by Karen's outburst. Ma'am, I'm sorry for the inconvenience, the mailman said, his voice trembling. I'll try my best to deliver your package as soon as possible. You better do, Karen said, glaring at him. I could see that the mailman was in a difficult position, and I didn't want to leave him alone with Karen. So... I decided to accompany him to his next stop and help him out with his deliveries. As we walked, I learned more about the mailman, whose name was Mike. He was a kind man who'd been working for the post office for over 20 years. Mike told me that he'd been dealing with entitled parents like Karen for years, and it never got any easier. He said that he had to deal with angry customers almost every day, and was starting to take a toll on him. I listened to Mike's story and felt sorry for him. I knew how it felt to deal with entitled parents and it was never a pleasant experience. As we approached Karen's house, I braced myself for another confrontation. Sure enough, Karen was waiting outside her house, tapping her foot impatiently. When she saw us, she rushed over and demanded her package. Where is it? I've been waiting all day, she said, her voice rising. I'm sorry, ma'am, but we haven't received it yet, Mike said, trying to calm her down. That's not good enough, Karen said, her face turning red with anger. I want my package and I want it now. I could see that Mike was starting to lose his patience, and I decided to step in before things got out of hand. Karen, can I talk to you for a second? I said, grabbing her by the arm. What do you want? She said, shaking me off. I just want to talk to you for a second, I said, trying to keep my cool. I think you're being a bit unreasonable. Unreasonable? I ordered something, and I want it delivered, she said, her voice rising. I understand that. But you don't have to yell at the mailman, I said, trying to reason with her. He's just doing his job. Karen scoffed at me and rolled her eyes. I don't have time for your lectures, she said, turning to Mike. Where's my package? At this point, I knew there was no reasoning with Karen. 
Karin's behavior was getting out of hand, and I could see that she was starting to get violent. She started grabbing at my arm, trying to pull me away from Mike. I could feel my blood boiling, and I knew that I had to do something to protect myself. Karen, let go of me, I said, trying to shake her off. No, you're not going anywhere until I get my package, she said, tightening her grip. That was it. I had had enough of her entitlement and her aggressive behavior. I quickly pulled my arm away from her grip and pushed her back. Karen stumbled backward, her eyes wide with shock. What the hell do you think you're doing? She said, her face contorted with anger. I think you need to calm down and stop acting like a child, I said, my voice rising. Karen was fuming now, and I could see that she was about to lunge at me. But before she could make a move, I punched her in the face. It was a split second decision, but it was the only thing I could do to protect myself. Karen stumbled backward, her hands clutching her face in pain. I could see the shock and disbelief on her face as she tried to make sense of what had just happened. You, you hit me, she said, her voice trembling. I had to, I said, my voice calm but firm. You were getting violent and I had to protect myself. Karen didn't say anything else. She just stood there, her face red with anger and her eyes filled with tears. I could tell that she was humiliated and embarrassed. A part of me felt sorry for her. But another part of me was proud of myself for standing up to her and not letting her get away with her entitled behavior. Enjoying the stories yet? If you do, please subscribe, like, and comment. My first post here. First, I would like to thank you all for the amazing environment. I've been back to the internet because of this place and reading up all the posts I can. I love that you all have a kink for justice as big as a kink for storytelling. My story begins working for a financial institution, heaps of overworking and abuse, and we were contractors from a company in Brazil. We worked 12 plus hour daily easily as we had to deploy stuff at midnight as it was a critical app. I was online all the time. I took all the heavy fire from the client who dealt directly with me. I had a manager who did nothing and despised me because the team loved me. She didn't know the teammates' names and things like this. We were the only team to have a planned on duty schedule set up the month before and everyone relied on us, client side and contractor company side. I was the only one the client had the cell phone and they never complained. This manglement loved to give everyone's phones to the client so he could call devs nonstop Saturdays, Sundays, moon or sun on the Scott. I put my foot down for the first time with this. The second time she tried to send a two-month girl intern to work with all males from another contractor company, you could imagine how workplace abuse would be dealt with, alone. Now, I know there's a lot of amazing people in the world, but I wouldn't put my hand in the fire for the tech community. Sorry. This was the second time I put my foot down. We had an altercation in a call with the client, because I directly said the intern productivity would plummet having to work with a strange team and under rules that are not our companies, and this could even lead to a lawsuit. She was pissed. We hung up. She calls me alone 0.2 seconds later and scolds me, asking how do I think questioning her would be perceived. Now, I'm a scrum master. The only thing I do is conduct meetings and defuse bombs, so I thought she could use the neuron I freely gave her with my explanation. And I answered hushing these serious decisions in front of the client said more about her incompetence than to discuss with me in front of him. I think I heard a vein pop on her head. She hung up. She hung up. Now, it gets good. Thanks for reading my introduction. 30 minutes pass and I receive an email stating I was on HR watch for misconduct and insubordination. I was required to take one mentoring session weekly during one month, filling up an Excel through the week with everything I did and recounting on the sessions to see where I could improve. The thing is, she saw the dumpster fire the project was and just got accepted to switch project client, so she was going away next week or so and my new manager would be a flower of a person who had nothing to do with this crap. I called HR and told them I would like to request her as my personal mentor, as she was the one who pointed so many improvement feedbacks to better my performance and was an example for me. Of what not to do, but I left this part out. They thought this was an amazing idea. The sessions had her and the HR worker responsible for the case, so she had to put a mentoring face, and lo and behold, I turned into Caspar Hauser during those sessions. I asked everything. I would fill the Excel to the brim with everything I did, 
including emails, chat convos, and even screen grabs from my personal phone the client used a message and requested to go through them so she could approve my company speech. I would link Excel files inside this Excel file so she had absolutely everything I did. One per row. Those sessions took two to three hours every Friday, scheduled at 8 a.m. by me, as she would be sure to complain when the team worked until 2 a.m. and I would let them come in late. She would have to rate everything in a drop-down cell, write the week's outcome, and come up with action points for next week. I couldn't help her with this as I was there to learn. In the last meeting, I requested her manager to be on the meeting, a woman who filled my manager gaps when I needed most, and we had an amazing relationship. She agreed, as in her view, this was a successful mentoring case from her employer. I finished the meeting, asked for two minutes at the end, and forwarded my two weeks here in Brazil at four written by hand with all the points that made me quit and receipts. Including a part of the fight in front of the client I was able to record with my phone when I saw things going south. I still think about her, so this is the sad thing. But I now have an amazing job at a big tech company and vowed to never be like her. Please note that this story is pre-COVID. This can't be considered petty revenge because I wasn't the target of malice here and even though this man didn't direct his nonsense at me at the time, he really seemed entitled enough to meet the criteria. I just wanted to clarify this, just in case. Time to begin. Right now, I'm feeling proud of myself for doing something wild. This last weekend, my wife and I decided to visit her family. They live in a much larger city than we do, and we go now and again to break up the monotony. On Saturday, my wife and her sister wanted to go shopping at one of the larger malls in the area. Not wanting to do nothing alone, I tagged along. At some point, while listening to their girl talk, I decided to grab a bite, so I told my wife and headed to the food court. At this point, the lunch rush was still going on, so the place was fairly packed. I decided on Chinese food, a place I had been to before, so I trusted that the food was good. So I got in line to wait like anyone else. This particular restaurant was pretty simple. It had four cashier lanes and grills behind it, where you could watch the cooks make your order while you wait but being a Chinese place. It took longer than the typical fast food place, so the lines were moving slowly. While waiting, my phone died. I simply forgot to charge it earlier, so I started watching the crowd to avoid getting bored. Nothing out of the ordinary until I noticed the entitled dad with two boys a little bit ahead of me in the line next to me. The two boys, maybe around 11 and 9, must have been getting impatient because they would periodically start to screw around or bug the entitled dad occasionally pushing each other around or asking when they would have food. The entitled dad looked like he was growing more agitated by the minute. Every time he had to turn to deal with these two, his face grew redder and redder. Understand, dear reader, that this was a busy, loud area, and they weren't being super loud, so they didn't really attract attention yet. I did, however, have to turn away now and again to avoid being noticed, though. The trouble started when the entitled dad finally reached his turn. The girl politely did the usual and asked him for his order, but instead of just ordering, the entitled dad started to complain, mainly about how long he and the two boys were in line for. She did her best to be polite, but he just kept going for a few minutes. By this time, the gentleman behind the trio was also getting annoyed. He noticed me and gestured to the entitled dad with a you-gotta-be-kidding-me look, so I just responded with a shrug. As far as I knew, he wasn't wrong if the entitled dad was in such a hurry. Why not just get your food and be done with it? Eventually, the girl at the register was able to get the order. I was now second in place in my line and right next to the two kids by this point. I could hear the angry, entitled dad go into a tirade about the performance of the restaurant and insist that if it wasn't for his kids wanting it, they would have gone to a better place. About how said Japanese place was better, but because it was currently closed, they had to suffer through this. The entitled dad even started to insult the poor girl behind the counter. The gentleman behind him and the two boys tried to tell him off telling him they're just doing their best, but the entitled dad shot back with the typical I'm a paying customer so I can do what I want excuse, and kept going. The girl was obviously growing upset as the entitled dad was bullying her and I could see tears start to form in her eyes. The entitled dad just wouldn't give her a break. The gentleman behind the trio was also looking like he was getting ready to throw punches. At this moment, I thought that I really wanted to do something, but I didn't want to get into a fight even if I had backup or ended up being the backup for someone else. That's when I noticed it. The entitled dad was wearing cargo shorts, the kind that never seems to fit right. 
I thought for a second and found an alternative idea. I found myself just reacting, and the whole thing took only a few seconds. I stepped forward in between the dad and the two kids, grabbed both side loops of the seat of his pants, and yanked as hard as I could. Without stopping, I immediately ran for it. I had to push through a lady in the last line, but I made it. I heard a lot of screaming behind me, but not wanting to get pummeled by an angry, entitled father, I didn't even look back. I ran to the other side of the mall where my wife was still shopping with her sister. I knew my wife enough to predict what stores they would be in. I felt safe enough in a girl's clothing store next to my wife, so after I caught my breath, I just started laughing. My wife asked what happened, and I just told her I would tell her later. I didn't want to spoil their shopping, so I spent the rest of the time keeping an eye out for an angry, entitled dad. I did spot them at one point, now with a blonde lady and a little girl in tow, but that was it. I was lucky enough to avoid them. When we decided to go eat, the lunch rush was pretty much over and I just had to know. I went back to the Chinese place, and luckily the young girl was still there, so I purposely waited behind an extra person for a chance to talk. When I got the chance, I asked her what happened to the entitled dad. She told me that someone yanked his pants down mid-tirade. The guy who did the deed took off, but the entitled dad couldn't catch him because the gentleman behind him took the opportunity to push him flat on his butt. The gentleman just insisted that he was trying to catch the culprit and missed. Then the entitled dad, being the official center of attention, just grumbled for the rest of the time. He paid and sat down on the opposite side of the food court somewhere. I wanted to laugh, but just in case I never told her. It was me who did the pantsing even though I really wanted to, so I just took my order and joined my wife and her sister for lunch. I told my wife later, and we had a laugh. She scolded me for pulling such a stunt, but was proud of me for finding such a funny method for helping the cashier. So this is the story about how my wife and I got her boss fired. For reference, my wife will be called Mary and her boss is Karen. I know, original, right? So Mary started working for a college five years ago as an administrative assistant. She was given odd and end tasks, one of which was writing up the school handbook. She noted in the handbook that staff were required to take time for professional development. After some years and a few promotions, she lands a manager position in the department and spearheads an initiative to have all staff under her have approved time to attend professional development conferences. Karen always rejected this idea, but Mary decided one day to go to Karen's boss. We will call Bob. Bob is great once Mary went around Karen and got Bob to approve conferences for everyone in the department. For the next year or so, everyone got to choose any conference around the continental USA to attend on the company's dime. Everyone would come back with notes taken at every session attended, attached with a conference itinerary, and given to their direct superior as proof of attendance. The employee would also present key points learned from their conference at a weekly departmental meeting. Pretty simple morale-boosting opportunity, until someone had to abuse it. Karen had been bragging to other department directors, as well as to Mary, about swimming with dolphins during her recent travel to a conference. Mary didn't think much of it, as usually there was sometimes a free morning or afternoon to do with as you please at these conferences. My wife told me this during our nightly pillow talk and having been raised in Orlando, where Karen decided to attend a conference. My head popped up and I asked where. Mary replied with a well-known location run by a well-known company with a well-known company with a whale for a logo. I quickly replied that they close at 5.30. When did Karen have time for this? Mary, who had access to Karen's itinerary, dropped her jaw when she realized the conference Karen attended did not have free time during the business hours of the dolphin swimming experience. Mary went into an enraged clerical fury as she pulled up Karen's full travel itinerary for flight, hotel, conference, and other reimbursement. The school does most departmental work online and therefore the school's server can be accessed remotely from secured or approved devices, like Mary's phone. She also checked the website where Karen went swimming to confirm hours of operation. According to the record submitted, there was no way Karen had time to swim with dolphins during the experience's normal business hours without missing part of this conference. And according to Karen's itinerary, she was supposed to have attended all sessions. Mary worked hard to have the privilege to travel the country to attend conferences, and Karen just screwed it all up. Mary eventually wrote all of this up, attached the itinerary documents, attached photos of the encounter, and apparently from other theme parks that Karen had neglected to mention, from social media, attached the hours of operation, and sent this all to Bob. 
Mary texted me about an hour after she got to work the next day, saying Bob was livid. He was currently in the process of questioning everyone Karen had bragged to, to see if the stories all matched up. A few days later, Karen was fired from the company for only attending one session of the three-day conference, lying about her report filed using company funds for travel hotel and food to go play at theme parks, and for submitting a time card to get paid while doing all of that. Although Mary's name was anonymous through all of this, Karen seemed to blame Mary anyways. Karen sent mean and dark texts to Mary several times until the school could send a cease and desist. Worse of all, I guess Karen's husband was a deadbeat, so not only did Karen have to trade in her massive SUV for a smaller vehicle, she had also just signed on a new house, only days before she was fired, and now had no income to support the said home. I'm not completely cynical. People shouldn't be homeless. But Karen had also taken credit for a lot of Mary's work, made Mary do her workload, and many other instances of foul play I can't remember because there's so much pillow talk. Needless to say, Karen reaped what she sowed. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more captivating stories. Share your own experiences, opinions in the comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.